She's the resiliency rebel, and her book, The Good Stripper, has been described as an unapologetic FU survival guide. Marcy Warhoft is a warrior woman who teaches young men and women how to reclaim their power to build a healthy and strong self-esteem. Her background is like an edge of your seat action packed thriller series. Accepted into a prestigious theater school, Warhoft is a mother of two, a former stripper, and her life has been shaped by a bank robbing stepfather, the loss of her brother, eating disorders, and a dysfunctional marriage. She learned how to stop judging herself and embrace who she is. She is a resiliency coach and a body image advocate. Please welcome Marcy. <laughs> Thanks for having me. That's quite the introduction. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know where to start. What came first in that realm of backstory? Was it your stepfather, your brother? I would say on paper, my life started out really traditionally. I had a, two parents. I was the youngest of three kids, older brother, older sister. I was very opinionated and very confident. And I would always dance and sing and play sports. And I would stand up for what I believed in. And my mother was fantastic in that she would always tell me that I had a voice and the right to use it and really validated who I was. And so it was great. And then <laughs> I guess the first thing was when my parents split up. My parents split up when I was 10 and my father left. And it was tough because he didn't want to be a parent and he didn't want to help. He didn't help at all with any kind of support. I left my mom with these three kids, but it wasn't as traumatic as it should have been because my mother was so phenomenal and the rest of us just got closer. So I was very close with my mother and my brother. My sister and I were seven years apart and at that time we're not super close. So my mother and my brother were everything. So the first thing I will say that really changed my life, completely changed my life was when I was 17 and my older brother got sick and he died when he was 21. That absolutely was the catalyst for mm. how my life just turned completely upside down. So I was this kid who believed I could do anything. And then I started to believe that I wasn't, I didn't deserve to be here. I thought he deserved to be here instead of me. At that age, at 17, you're supposed to feel invincible. I think most people still, if they haven't been touched by a lot of trauma, you still feel like you hear things happen and you think, well, that won't happen to me. But when something like that happens, I didn't know anyone who had lost a sibling. I didn't know anyone who had lost even a grandparent at that point that you realize, oh my God, bad things can, can happen and do happen. But I also didn't feel safe. I always say the minute before I heard my brother died was the last minute I've ever felt truly safe in the world. And my way of controlling what was going on around me at that age was, you know, the only thing you can control, really control is yourself, is your body. Right. And so that's when my eating disorder started because I was able to control what I was eating, what I wasn't eating, how much I was exercising, not exercising. It was also easier for me to focus on my empty belly than his empty room. So that became a distraction for me. And then moving through life, when you have this low self-worth and, and self-esteem and feeling like you don't deserve to be here, it really sets you up for being manipulated by people, but also by life. Life just kept hitting me and hitting me and hitting me. And I just I didn't have it at that point. I didn't have the resiliency or I did, but I didn't know that I did to keep moving forward. And with my stepfather, <laughs> you know, I laugh at it now because it's so ridiculous. At the time, what, wasn't it that sounds funny? pretty incredible. <laughs> but at the time, sure. I mean, my mother had met this man through a good friend. It wasn't like she met him online through a very good friend. We didn't know about his past that he had been in prison. He told us he was a caterer and he would, in fact, I was so obsessed with food. He would take me to the play, the markets where he got his food, which was a lie. And he would talk to me in detail about the stuff that he would cook and make for the different events. And he would be gone every two weeks. He would take off for a big church breakfast that he was cooking and he would be gone all day. And we had to be very quiet the night before because Eddie had to be busy the whole day. So we had to be very quiet so we could be rested. They were together for two years and it was right after my brother died. So my brother died. And then it was about a year later when he had gone off 
to cook for this event. And my mother got a call saying, no, he's been arrested. He was outside of a bank. That's well, like he's a, leaving a bank. the worst, the worst lie I've ever heard. <laughs> It was so bizarre, but he was, but here's the crazy thing is it wasn't a one shot deal. He was wanted for two years. He was wanted for 48 counts of bank robbery and the police had his picture. They didn't have his name, but they had his picture. They gave him a name. He carried a little bag, like a satchel. They called him the satchel bandit and uh, yeah, they caught him and he got the max, which was 21 years. Wow. <laughs> to me, it's hilarious now, but at the time, and we're talking, my mother just lost a child and then she finds that her husband is leading yeah. this double life of crime. Devastating for your mom. It was brutal, brutal, crazy. At what age did you start dancing? Well, so here's the thing with that. I can't really call myself a former dancer in the sense or former stripper. I did that, but that I did very briefly. So the yeah. dancing part, so I let it double huge. life for a little a while. Huge, it takes, it's a I don't know thing. about you, but no. I think it takes a lot of guts. Here's the thing. It was during a time I was married. I had two toddlers. My life was in a mess. It was my relationship had taken a crazy turn. So I always say I lived a double life for several years. The dancing was several months. So that the, the dancing was part of this double life, but it was significant, even though it didn't last for years. What I would do, my husband at the time knew what I was doing. That wasn't the secret part. No one else knew, but I would, it was very important to me to be home for my kids. So I was home with them all day. And then I would put them into bed. I would go to the club. I would dance. I was still dealing with my eating disorder. I didn't have to have a sip of alcohol or a drug the whole time. I had my protein shake in my locker. I knew at this time, go and have my protein shake. And then I would dance. And then I would leave, get home by four in the morning, change into my gym clothes, go to the 24-hour gym, work out, probably go to the grocery store, pick up some stuff for the kids, come home, take a shower, start the next day there were times I would go days like two days without sleeping so it was it was significant and again I am getting on stage naked you know afraid that my kids are going to find out that people at school are going to find out but I was I was I was doing it and I was in my early 30s think a little bit about that industry I imagine there's like so many minefields that many of the women you know, and you got a scrupulous managers and, you know, and they try to con you out of money and cut through working environments. So what did you see when you were in this, in a brief time, what did you see when you were in this? It, it, was, it was interesting because it's funny because when people don't know very much about me and they just know the title and they'll say, oh, well, you did what you needed to do to put food on the table. I'm like, no, that wasn't my situation at all. You know, my, I was married yeah. and he had a good job and there was food on the table. It was because I was in this situation with my marriage where I didn't have a lot of self-worth. And at that point, my mother had died as well. And oh, I didn't have anyone around. I did, and we were leaving close. She died while I was pregnant. So I really, mm. I had lost all of my support. And I started to feel like I served two purposes. And one was to be the best mother I could be because I adored my children. And I'd had the luxury of having this great mother, albeit for a short period of time. And then to be a sex toy, I felt like that's all that I was good for. That's how I had to find I my worth. And I, and I've been still battling this eating disorder. So I had met a trainer who was like, oh, I can get you to look like a fitness model, but I had to pay. And I felt too guilty to take from the household money. So I had to make my own money. Uh -huh. But again, how do I make money when I want to be home with my children all day? Now, normally <laughs> women will come up with something else. Not everyone's going to go, oh, I'm just stripped. What else but is going to make point, you that money though? <laughs> yeah, but you still, most wouldn't do that. But at that point I'd been going to strip clubs with my ex-husband and, and we'd been doing the swinging thing. And I already felt like, ah, people are seeing my body anyway. I might as well profit from it. So that's when I started that. It was different in that I was lucky enough that I could go when I wanted to. You yeah, know, what, I didn't yeah. feel the, the pressure that way. But it is, I'll tell you this. I loved being on stage. I have always liked kind of dancing. I still do. I remember being there and a woman said to me, she was working there and she said, how long did it take you to work here before you were able to like, have the confidence to go on stage? And I'm like, what are you talking about? She's like, look, I've been here for weeks and I can't, I didn't even know that was a thing. First day I was up. So some people it's still tough because you're still, you're saying, look at me, you're going fully naked from where I'm from. That part was fine. Even dancing, even the lap dancing part, I felt I had some control and I like that. Yeah. I'll tell you the part that I hated. 
the part that I hated was getting off stage and walking around and sitting with men and trying uh-huh. to convince them to buy me. That part was hard. I didn't yeah, like that- a lot of men who loved having that control, who were really unkind that way. Some were fine, but there were some that would do tricks and do things to not have to pay you or always try had situations where they would, and I'd have to say to them, put that away. <laughs> Not that kind of club. <laughs> so there was that. And then there were the people who you were warned that there are men who'd come in and they just constantly want, would put their hands where they, they weren't supposed to. And there was the fear factor of, you know, I'm driving home at four o'clock in the morning and you're by yourself. And I was putting myself in, in a situation that wasn't safe. However, at that time, unfortunately, I felt that if something bad happened to me, I deserved it. Oh, I didn't God. feel because I had made a lot of mistakes and, and I was dealing with a lot of sort of trauma induced promiscuity. So I wasn't thinking, oh, but this might take me away from my children. I was thinking if something bad happens, well, it's supposed to happen. It was tough because again, there were moments when I felt like, oh, this feels good and I feel empowered. And I'm reclaiming my sexuality, but I wasn't. I was really yeah. confusing being sexual with being sexualized. Right. And they're two yeah. very different things. If a lot of people feel though that dancing like that is a part of control like you control the message really and you're not going home with them no matter what no (laughs) yeah exactly well that that is the funny thing it's any man who's at a club who thinks that they're better than the women dancing you're not i mean the women are absolutely he's got your number like i mean walk to the door (laughs) it's ridiculous and that's the thing like when i talk about that i carried a lot of shame for years not the dancing. I would never want it to That's ever good, come across yeah. that I think that any woman or any anybody who strips should it's feel any shame. <laughs> no, absolutely. No, and to be very honest, I will tell you that it's like you said, how else are you gonna make money? There unfortunately, there aren't there are limitations if you are either of a certain age or you don't have education or your hours because you have children, whatever it it can be very difficult. So I find our society so messed up in the sense that women have been sexualized forever and we are always sexualized. But the minute a woman profits off of her own sexuality, yeah, then she's judged. And that's, that's what's completely unfair. Yeah, God forbid if we started stripping at this age, nobody would want to see us. I don't think that's true. There's a niche for everything. There's a I guess, place. yeah. Are you kidding? Yeah. <laughs> um, don't count it out. So what was a turning point when you decided that you needed to take charge and you felt you needed to need a recovery. Many years later, (laughs) uh, it took a lot. By the time I started to get healthy, oh, it was a lot of damage had been done. I mean, I had also been through a lot of illnesses and some some physical challenges that put me in the hospital for months and Mm -hmm. I had to rebuild my body several times. So there were a lot of challenges. And again, I did a lot of things during that. I call it my crazy time. A lot of promiscuity, a lot of sort of sharing my body in ways that I wish I hadn't. That left a lot of shame in me. And I sort of had two turning points because there was a turning point that happened when I got out of that part of my life, when I realized that what I talk about in my book, I I won't share it here, but I had this really rude awakening one morning when I realized that what I was doing wasn't just hurting me, it was hurting other people. And I wasn't okay with that. I decided to stop all of the dancing, the swinging, all of it, and get healthy. I went into an eating disorder program and I did that. And I had been put on high doses of narcotics for surgeries. I got off everything and and that was great. So that was the first turning point. But the problem was I still carried so much shame over the things I had done, which is why I dedicated my book to anyone who may be struggling to forgive themselves for the mistakes they made when they were just trying to survive. Because I see that's what I was doing now. But at that time, I just saw my mistakes. I didn't give myself credit for like, what, why was I making those mistakes? I was just trying to survive a multitude of trauma. So because I was still had that shame, it was weighing on me. And I was still in a marriage that wasn't healthy. We were focusing on our children and making sure they were okay. And they were very busy. We had that as a distraction, but I was not in a healthy situation. I did not feel loved or protected. And and I was carrying shame. And so even though at this point, I was a recognized expert in body image and self-esteem, I had a program that I was taking to schools and talking to teachers and parents and kids of all ages. And I was on TV all the time talking about it. I started to feel like a fraud because here I'm teaching other people how to 
feel good about themselves. And I felt like a terrible person because of my mistake. I was also terrified that my past would come out, terrified that it would impact my children in a negative way. And I crashed again and started to feel, this is in my forties, that I didn't deserve to be here. And maybe my kids would be better off without me. And maybe I'm taking up space and resources that I don't deserve. And that was a very low point for me. Then I had this really weird, random interaction with this woman at the grocery store one day. And I had dropped my kids off at school. I had been bawling my eyes out and just didn't know how I was going to get through the day. And she made a reference about how I'm always give off a positive light. And I was like, who is she talking about? Like I couldn't, but it messed me up and it made me think maybe I'm not done yet. Maybe there's something in there that's still, maybe there's a little flicker of something positive. And that's when I decided to make some changes. And I decided that I was going to start working on leaving my marriage. I was going to start getting myself healthy again. It still took a little while, but it was realizing it's that cliche and I hate cliches, but it's the cliche of, I didn't go this far. I didn't come this far to just go this far. I had to start forgiving myself and it was leaving my marriage and forgiving myself for the things I was doing my best with what I, with what I knew and what I had. That's when everything changed. And it took a, must have taken a lot of courage to write your book and your podcast. Wow. I love the title, How to Ruin <laughs> Your Own Reputation. And it champions some incredible people. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. What stands out for me about all of it, and yourself included, is that everybody in this side of the realm or whatever you want to call it, there are human beings. <laughs> and... They're amazingly resilient even just to stay in that industry because most people that are criticizing them the most would have a difficult time. So let's talk about the the podcast and what courage it took to do the book or which came, the book came first or the podcast came first? The book, the book came first. Yeah, yeah. I had friends who knew some of my story. It's hard to put yourself on paper like that. Well, it's it, you putting it on paper is one thing. Then when you realize people are going to read it, it's a whole other thing. I had some friends who were encouraging me to write a book for a long time, even though they didn't even know my whole story. Who's going to care? I'm not famous. And what's it? Not, when it's your life, you don't realize sometimes how intense some of your experiences are. There was a multitude of traumas that I went through, but it's your life. So you just, yeah. it, you just kind of go through it. And when, but then when other people hear about it, and they go, that's not normal. Then you realize, oh, maybe there is something there. And also my friends saw my resilience. They didn't see my mistakes as much. I was focusing on, on how I survived instead of the fact that I survived. You know, I was criticizing myself for how I did it instead of being proud that I did it. I was still hiding. I was still terrified for decades that my past was going to come out. And I think I was turning 50. And I realized that I was not giving myself the opportunity to be fully me because I sort of thought the more people who know me and see me, then they'll find out more about me. My kids still didn't know about my past and didn't know how it would affect me. It was scary, but I got to this point where I'm like, okay, there's more years behind me than ahead of me. I don't want to waste any minute being afraid. I didn't, I really wanted to stop caring what people thought, like for real. And I thought, you know what, if people are going to judge me, let them judge me. At least let them know what they're judging me for. I'm going to put it all out there. Plus, there's this thing about you can't feel shamed over what you don't feel ashamed of. So I had to, the only way to stop being afraid that people are going to come at me with stuff they found out is for me to say, no, here it is. Like, you can't, what are you going to shame me for? I'm saying it and I'm not ashamed of it anymore. So I decided to start writing it and I wrote it quickly. It took me about seven months to write and that's all I did. I just sat in my basement and just wrote like sometimes through the night because there were chapters that were too hard for me to be in more than one day. I wrote and I thought I decided if I was going to write it, I was going to write it full on. I wasn't going to hold back. I wasn't going to candy coat anything. And that's kind of how I live my life now. But it was very, I mean, people ask if it was cathartic in some ways. Yes. In some ways it was really hard. I was opening up scars that had healed. And the only way to get people to understand and feel what I was feeling was for me to open up those wounds and feel that again. So that was really hard. But also by putting it on paper, which is why I always tell people, just write your story. Like, even if no one's going to see it, because there were so many things when it's swirling in your head, 
you still judge it. But when I put it on paper, I was able to go, oh, wait a minute. Now I know why I thought that, you know, now I know why I felt that I get it. And I was able to, to understand and have empathy for myself, which was huge. I started to feel proud of what I had survived and see the magnitude of it. When I was lucky enough to find out it was going to be published, that's when I kind of went, oh, wait a second. Okay. <laughs> so people are going to know, like people are going to read. They're going to, whenever somebody will message me and say, oh, I just ordered your book. I'm like, oh God, you're going to know, you're going to know a lot about me. <laughs> it's a very odd thing, you know, to hear from people you went to camp with when you were seven or like a teacher. It's really weird, but it was the best thing I ever did. Of course, I had to tell my children about it and then, and they were phenomenal. I mean, they were really phenomenal. Did about they it. know but about I, I, your secret life? What? No, at all? they didn't No, but they were so unfazed. They really were because for them also, I mean, they're amazing human beings. I'm very lucky with that, but also because I kept it such a secret, all they remember was me being there. Yeah. Right. I would go days without sleeping because it wasn't like I'd come home and go into bed and have them fend for themselves. I wasn't the hot mom or the cool mom. I was like the overprotective <laughs> mom I was the one like wear your helmet and blah, blah, blah. like I was there all the time so for them they were like when was it they said we're in your corner we got your back which was the best thing at really? the time they were in their late 20 well late 20 late teens maybe early 20s they've been phenomenal but I have to tell you that I was prepared either way yeah. I've been prepared for how anyone was going to react because yeah. I had to get to the point where I would be okay in order to release it because if I wasn't okay with myself, then the minute somebody said something negative, I would have crumbled because I've crumbled in the past. So I knew it was the right time because I was okay. Then anyone who would have had anything negative to say, it doesn't affect, doesn't affect me because what I've learned is the hard part was going through what I went through. I went through that and I survived it. It's not about being judged for it. That's not going to hurt me. If I survived what I went through, being judged for how I survived, that's not going to hurt me. The body image aspect, we got to talk about that because you don't look at dieting as healthy. I just think it's, we've been so brainwashed by our society since we were teeny tiny, like from, from birth. There's an old stat that says something like, by the time a girl's 17, she's seen over 250,000 messages from the media telling her that she should change. Now this was, this stat I found over a decade ago. So you imagine how much more it is now with the way the influx of social media. And then you imagine, okay, so if, if now a girl at 17 has seen a quarter of a million messages by the time she's 17, imagine her, her mother, her grandmother. We have been and boys are seeing it now too, right? Boys, absolutely. In fact, when I started my workshops at schools, I had one specifically for girls and one specifically for boys. And now, and then some work together. I had so many mothers calling me about their boys. So, because two things. One, girls are better at vocalizing and verbalizing what they're feeling. Whereas boys aren't given the language to do that or the, the safety to do that. It's rarer that you'd find a boy that's saying, I feel fat or I don't feel attractive. But boys, when I started in 2007, the issue that they were having that a lot of people didn't realize is they were getting it. They were getting criticized from two sides. It was either you're too big or you're too small. Yeah. So I would have kids who were nine years old who would come to me after a workshop and say, point to a picture of a guy from Twilight or some <laughs> actor with abs and be like, why don't I have a six pack abs like him? Because you're nine and he's actually 30 pretending to be 60. <laughs> but that was the thing. So they had pressure. It's either they're too small and they're not muscular enough yeah. or they're too big and they're not. So there's a ton of pressure and, yeah. and the whole dieting thing. It's so crazy. It's so weird because we do it backwards. What we should do, I shouldn't say should, but in my opinion, what's a healthier thing to do is if you eat in a way that, that's healthy, and when I say healthy, I mean, including the foods that you love. I'm not talking yeah. about only eating stuff that has tons of nutrients. Like you need you eat in a way, to survive. Too, you need right? it all yeah. and to be happy. But if you're <laughs> eating in a way that's balanced and you're moving, doesn't mean going to the gym every day, but it's always healthier to be, to not be sedentary. If you're moving, and you're able to enjoy your life, your body will tell you where you're supposed to be. If you're doing all those great things, and then your body is in the right place. But what we do is we just, we pick a number. I want to be 10 pounds lighter or 20 pounds lighter or 30 pounds lighter. And then we try right. so hard to get ourselves to fit into this by cutting out 
all the things that we love. And that's what doesn't make sense. We, we just try to need force the things we love. We, we, we gain, gain it, it back, but that's it. Because instead of forcing our bodies to be where we think they should be, we should listen to our bodies and let them tell us where they're supposed to be. And oftentimes they're not as small as you think it should be. I think it's so important what you just said. How do we put it tactfully? Your body changes over age. And as much as you can work out at the gym every day when you're, I don't know, 60 or 65, but it doesn't necessarily mean unless you're doing it 24 seven, you're not going to look like uh, Jennifer. You, you wanna, or, or well, Jeff, uh, you know, no, you're not going to look like I know, Jennifer. That's Lucas. so frustrating. I know it's so frustrating. <laughs> you know what the biggest shame is to me, what I think is such a shame is that our bodies work so hard to keep us alive every yeah. single day. And especially if we've been through and I've been through physical challenges and, and they do, so, it, they survive so much for us and they really keep us alive. And we have the audacity to criticize them for not looking the way that we want them to look. You know what I mean? It's like our whole lives, our body is, is they're amazing, amazing machines. And yet we will criticize them if we gain weight or if our stomachs aren't flat or hips are too big or our arms are too flabby or whatever. It's such an odd thing. And to reduce ourselves to that. When hmm. people say, for example, oh, age is just a number. I hate that expression because it's so much more than that. I mean, the, the accumulation of experiences that we lived through. I also think that this whole thing with women over 40, 50, 60, it, it amazes me when people talk about how we feel sort of dismissed or invisible. We're just getting started because it takes this long for us to understand who we are and to feel confident enough to say who we are and what we want and what we need and what we're worth and what we expect and what we won't put up with anymore. So there's so much amazing opportunity and God, the gift of getting older. And as someone who lost their family quite young too, I find myself also like saying, I really feel like I've aged. And then it's like, thank God. I mean, look at the alternative. We we're expected to mature emotionally and psychologically. We're expected that, but we're not supposed to change physically. And it's our bodies that are that are exposed to the elements and everything, gravity. I mean, of course they're going to change. So bizarre to me that that we have this weird fetish with youth when, oh my God, that's the beginning and that's great. But it's everything that we've, all the experience and everything that we've accumulated. And so it's worth celebrating. And instead of celebrating it, we fear it and we judge it. And, and also to fight it, you said you are going to age. We are going to age. And that's just how it works. You don't look the same at 16 as you did at six because that's just not how human people work. Our body, we look different and it continues. That's not a bad thing. It's the energy, especially women, because we do know it's harder on women. The energy that women and yet women are the hardest on women fear. can be. They can be, and the energy that we put towards this fear of looking older—it's such a shame to me because we are worth so much more than that. And it saddens me that we spend so much time and so much fear and so much energy on trying to reclaim who we were when we're so much better now. It seems to be a thing mostly for North American or Western culture, because when you look at other cultures like the Indian culture and both Indian cultures and Asian culture, they they celebrate their elderly and they look upon them as elders. And mm -hmm. uh, some of those cultures too, they don't age the same way. And but, maybe because they're not stressed about it. Yeah, <laughs> that could be. And right? also, they still have the misogyny. So yeah, you might have a point there. <laughs> I mean, it could be, but it's reason for that though is because our society has been sexualizing women forever and has been judging us and our looks forever. It makes sense that we're not going to re be respected for our knowledge and our experience and our wisdom because we never have been. It, that's the thing. You look back at, at, I remember when I was doing my workshops and there was a Barbie that was created in maybe 1980, maybe earlier. And it was a Barbie that was a sleepover Barbie. And she would show up. So her little, her accessories, she came with a few things. And two of her accessories were a book, and the book was 
how to lose weight. Oh, and God. inside it said, <laughs> don't eat. And then it came with a scale. Oh, and my God. this is what little girls were given to play with. So from a very young age, we're told it's all about how you look. I so, you look at the magazines, like the women's magazines are terrible because all the headlines on the front of them are basically how to keep your man and all this bull crap instead of what kind of career can you get at age 40? I'll tell you two things. So the big joke with for sure in one magazine, you'll get the how to make the best cookies. And then it's like how not to eat the cookies because you want to lose weight. <laughs> <laughs> it, that's the thing, but I will tell you, this is a great opportunity for tell you, there's a magazine called Defy Magazine that's come out in Canada. And I'm lucky enough to be on the advisory board for that as their body image expert. That is all about tearing down the patriarchy and misogyny. And it is empowering women in the workplace to stand up for themselves. And it is, <laughs> yes, Defy Magazine. It is absolutely, everything in there is confidence boosting. It's focusing on what women can do. It's run by women. Everything everything in it is is pro-women and you will not find any of that bullshit about <laughs> how to look great while you clean the house. It's none of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Your podcast, the people you champion on your podcast are so interesting and incredible. <clears throat> it's hard to pick favorites, but can you just yeah. tell us, describe a couple? I started it because when I re released my book, I had to realize, okay, it's going to be published. So am I ready to risk ruining my reputation? And I was, and it was the best oh. thing I ever did. The freedom that came from that, from being honest and being me, it's been amazing. And it gave people a sense of security and safety to reach out to me with their stories, even if they can't share it with other people. I really felt like we need to highlight people who are living unapologetically lives that some people don't understand or are stigmatized. And what I found is that a lot of people will come to the episodes with this, okay, I'm getting ready to judge this. And then they're like, oh, wait a second, I didn't realize. And so some of the people for sure, I mean, what's interesting, so Priestess Francesca is a dominatrix who deals with the fringe kind of dark side of BDSM and, and kink. And she's in incredibly intellectual. She was an engineer for years. And there's a very healing aspect to what she does. And that was very surprising to people because she's also talking about things like, you know, mommy play and diaper play and things <laughs> that don't seem that healing, but they are. And Casey is an OnlyFans model. And there's a lot of stigma against that. And two sides to every story. But she spoke very eloquently about how she found it and finds it empowering. And I spoke with Willow, who is a career sex worker. And that was a really important discussion because we talked about the importance of fully decriminalizing sex work. It's an interesting thing. You can't advertise, but you can buy. It doesn't make sense. It just it makes life very unsafe for sex workers. But that was an important conversation. Again, this is a person, she called herself a proud Canadian whore. That's what she did for a living. She wasn't using it as a way out, but she's a very opinionated hit an activist for sex workers. But we talk about a whole bunch of different things. We talk about dating. I talked to a sugar baby and sugar daddy, and that was kind of a little bit controversial. But I think it, I always say the more you talk and listen to people who are different than you, you really yeah. find out that we're not that different. And that's the thing. There's always something that I connect with, with everyone. It's interesting. Everybody has a story, no matter who they are. <laughs> no, they really do. They, they absolutely do. I will say one thing. This woman, Marcy Marie Simmons, she was a woman who was married with five kids and was sentenced to 20 years in prison and mm. served 10. And she shares her experiences on social media. And that was a very interesting conversation. And I spoke with a former NYPD police detective and his story was different. So I love it because I yeah. love hearing from people who don't get the opportunity to share their stories unfiltered like they do with me. That's that's fantastic. I just think it's a great, great podcast podcast. You had a quote, I don't know if it's from you or from one of your guests. If you give people the power to feed you, mm. you give them the power to starve you. To me, that is like the great philosophy. <laughs> There's people that probably won't understand what that means, but I think that quote says everything about resiliency. Yes, it's about for me, I don't even remember when, I, years ago I heard it and I really understand it because it's something that I've needed to remind myself of several times. If you put all of your self-worth, all of your safety, all of everything you are into somebody else, whether it's a partner, whether it's a job, anything, 
then the minute they take it away, you're left with nothing. And I did that in my marriage. I did that in so many different situations. You can't do that. It's okay to rely, lean on people here and there and feel support from people. Being supported is one thing, but if you give somebody else the power to hold your self-worth in their hands, then if they decide to take it away, you're left with nothing. We never want that. So we have to own our self-worth and own our self-respect throughout our entire lives. And that is a perfect way to end this. Thank you so much. This was so fun. Thank you. I just loved having you on the show. Well, thank you. I appreciate the conversation.